blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We have a very important principle that we try to follow in the Kobe Center. It's the principle of St. Augustine. In necessary things, unity. In doubtful things, liberty. In all things, charity. I think we've all seen a lot of apostolates destroyed because they didn't follow this principle. The difficulty is discerning sometimes between necessary things and doubtful things. And that's why, for example, at this retreat, uh, since Father Tom Hickey is the chaplain, if there was any question about something being wrong that involved something that was necessary, and we had to discern whether it was a necessary thing or a doubtful thing, then he, in consultation with his brother priest, would make the decision and we would all abide by it, and that's how we would remain united in charity. And I mention that now because um, some of what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation um, is not uh, official teaching of the church or anything like that, and yet I think that it's very important to share, even though it's just my view on a very important subject, because I think that it is a reminder of some things that are definitely true and must be kept in mind by all of us if we want to achieve our, our goal of contributing to the restoration of the true Catholic doctrine of creation as the foundation of our faith and of any effective evangelization. I think we all know that on October 13, 1917, Almighty God works the greatest public miracle since the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Fatima, Portugal, the miracle of the sun, witnessed by 70,000 people, to prove that the message of the Holy Theotokos was urgent and true. And in that message, she said that if her requests were heeded, Russia would be converted and there would be peace in the world but that if her requests were not heeded, and if mankind did not repent and turn back to God, Russia would spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. Now, if we were to ask most Catholics who know about Fatima, and unfortunately they're not the majority any longer, most of them would say that the principal error that took hold in Russia weeks after the miracle of the sun was communism. But that is really not correct, because if we study the lives of the principal leaders of the communist revolution in Russia, we find that they were people who lost their faith in God and in Christianity because of evolution. And it was their faith in evolution that made them confident atheists, confident materialists, confident communists. Without their faith in evolution as a scientific explanation for the origins of man and the universe, they would never have been the confident communists that they were. When Lenin took the reins of power after the Bolshevik Revolution, he had this sculpture on his desk, a chimpanzee sitting on a pile of books, one of which is Darwin's Origin of Species, contemplating a human skull. So Lenin looked at this sculpture as he authorized the murder of millions of his fellow human beings because they stood in the way of evolutionary progress, the progress to the communist utopia. Stalin was educated in a monastic seminary, but he read the works of Lyle and Darwin became convinced that evolution was true, started going around to the other seminary and saying, you have to read these books. The, the Bible's a pack of lies. We're descended from the apes. There is no God. 
and Stalin was responsible for the murder of over 20 million human beings because they stood in the way of evolutionary progress to the communist utopia. But Our Lady said that the errors would spread from Russia and the Russian communists were the principal sponsors of communism all over the world. They were the principal sponsors of communism in China. Here we have Bishop Cuthbert O'Gara, a missionary bishop in China, who watched as the communist troops came into his diocese. And he saw that in every town, they would bring the adults into a hall like this for a seminar. And he wondered, what is this seminar going to be? Is it going to be Marx? Is it going to be Lenin? Is it going to be Mao Zedong? No, it was always the same. The seminar was on evolution. You are a product of a material process of evolution. You have no soul. There is no afterlife. There is no God. Because the communists knew that if they could get the people to believe this, then they would accept the rest of the communist doctrine. So these are things that you already know. And I'm only repeating them now to make clear that we recognize that evolution was the principal error that took hold in Russia with the Bolshevik Revolution and was the foundation of communism and continues to be the foundation of communistic systems all over the world. But I want to shift gears now and talk about something a little bit different. I want to talk about the meaning of the Fatima consecration and how it relates to the fulfillment of our mission. If we go back to the beginning, we see that our Lord Jesus Christ prayed at the mystical supper that we would be one as he and the Father are one. He promises, promises us that the day will come when there will be one flock and one shepherd. We know that already exists within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. But he has told us that this will be obvious, and it will be obvious throughout the world. Now, if we go back to the beginning again, we see that our Lord calls the 12 apostles, and already these apostles represent different uh, gifts, different, and begin different traditions within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We see that in the first half of the first millennium, Greek is the primary language of theological discourse throughout the church. We find that there are certain practices which today we think of as being Eastern practices, which were fairly universal. For example, giving all the sacraments of initiation to those who were received into the church, including babies, little children who were baptized, chrismated or confirmed, and received Holy Communion. We also know that the church in this period was very decentralized. We know that it was during this period that the iconographic tradition really began to uh, develop within the church. And we know that there was a very great emphasis on what in the Eastern tradition is called divinization and the mystical dimension of the Christian faith. The idea that our faith is not so much a doctrine to which we ascend with our intellect, although it certainly is that, but it is also a life that we live. It's a life that we live in communion with God, sharing one life with Him. Now, during the same period, there is absolutely no doubt that throughout the entire church, there was the recognition that the successor of St. Peter was the court of last resort within the church. That was true from the beginning. And there were certainly times, as at the uh, Council of Chalcedon, where when Pope St. Leo the Great addressed the Christological controversy of that time, the Council Fathers recognized that St. Leo the Great was speaking as the successor of St. Peter and defining the dogma that answered the Christological question that was tearing the church apart or threatening to do so. But it's also important to recognize that within the first millennium, there were also, there were also times when 
the Pope did not exercise the authority that God gave him, the gift that God gave him, to be able to draw from the apostolic tradition to define a doctrine of faith or morals as contained in the deposit of faith so as to fully exercise the gift that was entrusted to him. And of course, the most uh, blatant example is that of uh, Pope Honorius, who was later condemned by Pope St. Leo II for allowing Rome's immaculate faith to be blemished by a sacrilegious betrayal. Why? Because when there was a controversy about whether our Lord Jesus Christ had one will, the divine will, or two wills, the human and the divine will, Pope Honorius uh, went along with um, or did not condemn or criticize a letter from the Patriarch of Constantinople who believed in the one will idea that our Lord only had the divine will. Well, you can see why this condemnation was justified because had Pope Honorius done what he was supposed to do and gone to the deposit of faith, he would have found that already in the Creed of Nicaea, there was the answer to this question because the Ecumenical Council had already defined that our Lord Jesus Christ is God and man. Therefore, he has to have a divine will and a human will. So the answer to the question that was threatening to tear the church apart was contained in the tradition that had been handed down. But the Pope did not automatically rise to the occasion and exercise his authority in the way that the crisis called for. And this is why he was condemned. And this is important to understand because in the history of so many misunderstandings between Eastern Christians and what we could call Western Christians or Latin Christians, both sides sometimes go to extremes, where in the West we emphasize the moments like Council of Chalcedon, where the Council Fathers said, Peter has spoken through Leo, as if that were always the norm. Whereas on the other side, we find especially among the Orthodox who are not in communion with us, that they would tend to focus on the episodes like those involving that involving Pope Honorius. And the fact of the matter is, in order to understand the reality, we need to take into account both of these kinds of events because both have occurred during the history of the church. And none of these events call into question the papal primacy, but they do falsify a, a kind of an exaggerated idea that is doing a lot of harm in the church today, that everything the Pope says is guaranteed to be true and free from error, because the definition of papal infallibility of Vatican I is extremely precise, and it specifically says that the Pope is not granted this gift of infallibility to define any new doctrine, <clears throat> but only to define a doctrine of faith and morals as being contained in the deposit of faith that was handed down from the apostles. Nevertheless, even in the East, we see that St. Maximus the Confessor sums up the, the true understanding of the Eastern Fathers and Doctors that old Rome was the church chosen, as he says here, of all the churches in every part of the, all the churches in every part of the world have held the greatest church of old Rome alone to be their foundation, seeing that according to the promise of Christ our Savior, the gates of hell will never prevail against her, and she has the keys of the Orthodox confession and right faith in him. Now, um, what happened, of course, in the second part of the first millennium is that as a punishment for our sins, as a punishment for our failure to live the gospel as fully as we should have, our Lord permitted the scourge of Islam to rise up. And what this scourge of Islam did is it divided Eastern Christianity from Latin Christianity. And this resulted in a communications breakdown between old Rome and 
New Rome in Constantinople, the Constantinople Byzantium. And this was uh, catastrophic because we reached a point where by the end of the first millennium, most of the Catholics in the West literally could not speak the same language as the Greek-speaking Catholics of the East. And this is the situation when St. Cyril and Methodius are sent by the Patriarch of Constantinople to evangelize the Slavic people. Now, this is a very interesting chapter in the history of the Church, and I think it's one that every Catholic should be well acquainted with, because it also offers us one of the best arguments against any Orthodox claims that would, in their view, justify their having separated from communion with the Pope of Rome and the Catholic Church. What happened was, St. Cyril and Methodius realized that the Slavic people had no common heritage with Hebrews and Greek-speaking, Latin-speaking people, and therefore they were convinced that these people needed to have the Holy Scriptures in their own language. And this created a huge controversy because there were many in the church who believed that there were only three sacred languages, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, and that it was almost a blasphemy to translate the Holy Scriptures into other languages. And it's simply a fact that the bishops of the Latin Rite, who were evangelizing territories to the west of the mission of St. Cyril Methodius, really worked against them. But the interesting thing is that St. Cyril and Methodius did not appeal to the Patriarch of Constantinople to support what they were doing. They knew the court of last resort is not in New Rome, it's in Old Rome. And so they went to Rome and they appealed to the successor of St. Peter to approve or not approve the method of evangelization that they believed God was calling them to adopt. And of course we know that the successor of St. Peter approved of their plan against this very strong criticism within the community of the Latin Rite. And this is why these Slavic people were given the immense gift of a, of a, a written language and given the divine liturgy and the holy scriptures in their own language. Now what's also very important to understand is that it was at this very time that um, Photius in Constantinople um, wanted to break and did in fact break communion with the successor of St. Peter over what he alleged to be very serious grievances, so serious that they justified breaking communion. Now, why, the reason why this is so important to understand is because uh, St. Cyril and Methodius were very familiar with all of these grievances. And if these grievances had been a just ground for breaking communion, with the Pope of Rome, then they would certainly have been in the vanguard to do it. But as history shows, while they were aware of these grievances and might have sympathized with them, they absolutely did not see them as any basis or justification for breaking communion with the Pope of Rome. And that is very important to understand because if you're talking to an Orthodox and you ask them the simple question, do you recognize St. Cyril Methodius as the apostles to the Slavs? Yes. Well then, why do you not follow his example? Why do you treat things that he did not regard as any justification for breaking communion with the Pope of Rome and the bishops in communion with him? Why do you not follow their example? Because all of the grievances that Photius mentions and some others that I don't have listed here, like the fact that um, Catholics of the Latin Rite fasted on Saturday, which was not in keeping with the ancient tradition, the prohibition against married priests, the prohibition against priests administering confirmation, and especially the addition 
of the filioque to the creed, none of these things were considered to be uh, any kind of justification for St. Cyril and Methodius to break communion with the Pope of Rome. With that as a little bit of historical background, I want to bring this, tie this back to Fatima because um, I want to show you how by the very way that our Lord and the Blessed Mother orchestrated the Fatima apparitions, they were showing us that the purpose, I would argue the primary purpose of the whole Fatima event was to heal the division between Eastern and Latin Christianity, which is the greatest catastrophe that has ever befallen the body of Christ. Now, if we go back to the uh, first half of the first millennium, we find that it was the common practice that new Catholics, new Christians, received all the sacraments of initiation. So little babies, when they were baptized, were also chrismated and received Holy Communion. Here we have St. Augustine uh, saying they are infants, but they share his sacraments. They are infants, but they share his table. Now, as you all know, before the Holy Theotokos, Our Lady of Fatima, appeared to the children, the Angel of Peace was sent to prepare them. And in 1916, he gives Holy Communion to the children, including Francisco and Jacinta, who have not been catechized, who have not made their first Holy Communion. Why does he do this? Everything that happens at Fatima on the side of God and our Blessed Mother has a definite purpose. And I think as we go on, we can begin to see that by sending the Angel of Peace to give Holy Communion to these little children who have not been catechized and who have not made their first Holy Communion in the normal way, um, this is one of a number of ways that the Fatima apparitions are pointing us to the East. It's uh, well known that just shortly before the visitation of the Angel of Peace, St. Pius X had lowered the age of Holy Communion. So children no longer had to wait until they were 11 or 12 years old. They could now make their first Holy Communion normally when they were around seven years old. But it may not be as well known, although I'm sure it's very well known to you, that the Pope himself was very eager to see Holy Communion administered to children as young as three years old. If they could tell the difference, difference between ordinary bread and Jesus, he was quite happy to give them Holy Communion. They did not need to know really anything more than that as far as he was concerned. And um, as you may also know, St. Padre Pio believed firmly that bringing little children, even babies, into the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament and introducing them to him and having them receive him in Holy Communion at the youngest possible age was extremely important. In fact, he encouraged another priest to found what was called the Armada Bianca, the White Army, to enlist little children at the youngest possible ages to bring them to do Eucharistic adoration and to make their first Holy Communion as early as possible. And St. Padre Pio is said to have told the founder of the Armada Bianca that when enough children belonged to this army of Eucharistic souls, that would, be, that would bring about or be the, the catalyst for the sign of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So here's a little illustration of the, the power of this uh, practice of infant communion. Uh, this little girl, Pia, is shown here at uh, two years of age. This is a true story. Her parents were affiliated with the Armada Bianca in Italy. And at the age of two, this little girl, in her first word that she spoke, showed that she understood that the Holy Eucharist is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so her parents were moved to uh, arrange with um, a priest for her to make her Holy Communion. 
Now at that time, her uncle was in a coma and the doctors had told the family they did not believe that he would ever come out of this coma that was going on. So the family took Pia uh, quite a long distance away to this uh, parish where the priest had agreed to give Pia her first Holy Communion. And um, when she uh, received Holy Communion, as you're seeing her afterwards uh, making her a thanksgiving, um, of course she was, she was filled with joy. And then on their way home, uh, the family were very concerned about this uncle because I guess normally they were checking up on him several times a day. And, this was before cell phones, and so they had no way to know how he was doing. But little Pia, who's just made her first Holy Communion, she says to her family, you don't need to worry about Uncle because he's fine. And sure enough, when they get back home, they find out that at the very moment that this little child <coughs> see Jesus for the first time, the uncle came out of the coma. <coughs> Now this is something that is really worth pondering. Because as I said to the children this morning in the children's program, um, we could easily say that our generation, the generation of adult Catholics, is in a coma. A person in a coma is not dead, but he's not really alive. And I think that describes our generation very well. We're not dead, but we're not really alive. We allow all kinds of abominations to go on, and it doesn't seem to bother us one little bit. And we need to be brought out of this spiritual coma in which most of us find ourselves. And I believe that the Fatima apparitions are pointing us to one of the keys to getting us out of this spiritual coma that is afflicting us adults who are supposed to be the leaders, the teachers, and the ones that show the way to our children. And I believe that um, we can see tremendous spiritual fruits and hasten the triumph of the Immaculate Heart if we learn from these um, actions of Our Lady of Fatima and, and actions of those who are inspired to respond to her initiative at Fatima by bringing little children to our Lord Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament for Eucharistic Adoration and to receive Him as early as possible in Holy Communion. Because the other thing we have to recognize is children are losing their innocence at younger and younger ages. Maybe back in 1917, we could say that, well, by seven years old, no child will have been exposed to corrupting influences. We can't say that anymore. Probably the vast majority of children in this country, by the time they reach seven years of age, have witnessed, have observed, have been damaged by all kinds of horrible, degrading influences, which have destroyed, in many cases, their innocence. So this is another reason to take this seriously. Now, um, what happens in the uh, second millennium is that because of this communications breakdown between the capital of Eastern Christianity and the capital of all Christianity in Old Rome, the, it's like a divorce. It's really like a divorce where we could say that Old Rome is definitely in the role of the man, is the head, and like the man, he puts a lot of emphasis on the law, on reason, on administration, and these are all gifts that we can see are abundantly conferred upon Old Rome. But meanwhile, New Rome, which has been cut off uh, by the scourge of Islam, so there isn't regular uh, communication any longer, um, also has very, very important gifts which are now in danger of not developing in unison with the gifts of the Latin church. And um, we can see this, for example, 
in, uh, I, because I don't have time to go into a vast subject in, in anything more than, than a very superficial way. But I, but I will give you one example because I think if you just ponder, uh, then maybe I'll give you two examples and you could just ponder these and see what you think of them. One example that I'm going to give you is the understanding of sacrament. If you go back to the time of the fathers and read how fathers East and West understood sacrament, what a sacrament is, and then you fast forward to the 17th century to St. Robert Bellarmine and what has become, I might say, the standard definition of a sacrament in the um, in the Western Church, in the Latin part, the speaking part of the Church, you will find a very significant difference because the definition that I learned and that I taught many classes of students that I prepared for the Sacrament of Confirmation was that a sacrament is a sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Now that is not a wrong definition, but I guarantee you it is not a definition that would have been recognized by the early fathers of the church. Because when we go back to the early fathers of the church, east and west, their understanding of sacrament is really a sharing in the mysteries of the life of Christ. It's the idea of sharing in the life of Christ is absolutely central to the understanding of sacrament. And I don't say that the definition that I learned and that I also taught for many years is wrong, but I think we can see that something has been lost in that definition. Now, let me give you another example. Um, we talked earlier in the week about the importance of the holy icons because the Seventh Ecumenical Council defined that the holy icons approved by the bishops of the church to be placed in the churches teach with authority in accordance with the word of God that is preached from the pulpit. Now, we see that in the West, sacred art is iconographic well into the Middle Ages. I showed you and others have shown you beautiful examples of that from Montreal Cathedral in Sicily in the West. But by the Renaissance, there's a revolution in sacred art in the West. And if we want to look at the holy icons of creation, we can see it very clearly in Michelangelo. Because in the iconographic tradition, there's no precedent for portraying God the Father in an icon of creation. But of course, in the Sistine Chapel, that's what Michelangelo does. Does that mean that he committed a terrible sin? No. Does it mean that his portrayal of creation does not communicate the truth? No. But it does mean that something has been lost. Something has been lost. And I'll give you an example of how we need that something that was lost to have the fullness of our heritage as Catholic Christians. And unfortunately, I don't have the slides to go with this, but I can really describe what I'm going to say to you well enough that I don't think you'll have any trouble understanding what I'm saying. Um, the administrative offices of the retreat center are in St. Gabriel's Hall. If you've been in St. Gabriel's Hall, you'll notice that they have a sort of an icon of the Annunciation where the Archangel St. Gabriel is visiting our Blessed Mother and she's accepting to become the Mother of God. Now, what's interesting is in the iconographic tradition, you will only see the Blessed Mother in one of two postures. You will see her standing, which is the norm, or you might see her sitting. But one thing you will never see in an authentic icon of the Annunciation is you will never see her kneeling. Now, does this mean that when Catholic artists in the West began to paint the Annunciation with the Blessed Virgin Mary kneeling, that they committed a terrible sin? No, it does not. But it does mean that something was lost. Think about it. Why in an authentic icon 
does the Blessed Virgin Mary stand or sit? The reason is simple. The Queen of Angels does not kneel in front of an angel. Now think about this. At the very time that we're having this revolution in sacred art in the West, and it is a revolution, what's happening? Millions of Catholics are leaving the communion of the Catholic Church. And what are their Pied Pipers telling them? The Blessed Virgin Mary, she was not special, she was not immaculate, she had to be redeemed, she was a sinner like everybody else. Now if you have sacred art showing her kneeling in front of an angel, doesn't that, it's, it may not teach the heresy, but doesn't it give some free reign to it? Whereas if you maintain the iconographic tradition with regard to the mystery of the Annunciation, you have a permanent safeguard against any idea that the Blessed Virgin Mary is anything other than the Queen of the Angels. So these are just a couple of examples of how we only have the fullness of our patrimony as Catholic Christians if we possess the heritage of East and West together in one. Now, and, and believe it or not, I really am coming back to Fatima because I want to emphasize that in this divorce, while Latin Christianity with its capital in Old Rome, the capital of the whole church, lost something precious, the Eastern Christian world lost even more. And no example of this is better than with regard to the teaching on holy marriage. If we go back to the beginning of the church, we see that all the fathers East and West were clear that our Lord Jesus Christ restored holy marriage to what God intended it to be in the beginning. And it was absolutely unthinkable that anyone would be married in the church, divorce, and marry again. It was unthinkable. The controversy in the early church was over whether if a husband and a wife married and one of them died, whether it was legitimate to marry again. That's what they were arguing about. But the idea that you could marry, divorce, and marry again while your spouse was living, that was completely out of the question because it was understood that our Lord Jesus Christ had absolutely forbidden that. Now what happened, of course, is that in New Rome, which became um, the capital of the eastern part of the Roman Empire, when the Emperor Justinian codified the Roman law, he did something very destructive, and that was he took the civil law of Rome with regard to marriage, and he brought it into, at least to a certain extent, the church law with regard to holy marriage. And this was very dangerous because the civil law allowed divorce for certain reasons, whereas the tradition of the church was completely against that. And St. John Chrysostom was well aware that this was already a problem in his time, and we see him preaching against this. And he says, don't cite the civil law made by outsiders, which command that a bill be issued and a divorce granted. For it is not according to those laws that the Lord will judge thee on the last day, but according to those which he himself has given. So we see that the tradition east and west is the same one that the Roman church has preserved, at least on the books and in authoritative teaching to this very day. And what do we find in Fatima? We find that one of the main points that Sister Lucia emphasizes again and again is that the sins that are really destroying society are the sins against the Sixth Commandment. And the Blessed Mother says that more souls go to hell because of sins of the flesh, sins against the Sixth Commandment, than for any other reason. And I apologize 
for uh, saying that June 13th was the anniversary of the vision of hell because as I was reminded, it was July 13th. So it's always good to make mistakes and be humiliated and then be corrected by such um, kind and learned brothers and sisters. But now there's a, a related problem that has been with us in the church from the beginning. And this is something I also want to draw attention to in relation to the message of Fatima the, and the errors of Russia. Because here we find St. John Chrysostom not only preaching strongly against this idea, well, the civil law allows divorce, so it's okay. We also find that contraception is being practiced. Contraception is being practiced even by people who are part of the Christian community. And St. John Chrysostom is emphatic that this is a truly heinous sin because if a child is conceived and then killed, at least the child lived for some period of time. But he says, with contraception, a man arrogates to himself the right to prevent God from even bringing that soul into existence. Now, this is a very important topic because um, as I've gone around the world and been in many different countries and, and talked to many different people, I have become more and more convinced that the true teaching on contraception, which has been maintained only in the Catholic Church and nowhere else, <clears throat> the teaching that was maintained throughout Christianity for 1900 years is the key to showing our Orthodox brothers and sisters that they need desperately to come back into communion with the Catholic Church. But it's also the key to persuading our separated brethren, our Protestant friends and neighbors, that they need to come back into communion with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. But we need to have a firm grasp of just a few facts. Number one, most forms of contraception do not contracept. They allow on a regular basis for children to be conceived, but in different ways they make the womb inhospitable so that the baby cannot survive. This is not just true of the birth control pill, it's true of the IUD and most of the contraceptive methods that are used. Now, what follows from this is that for every one of the 40 to 50 surgical abortions that occur every single year all over the world, there are at least five to ten times that many innocent babies who are being murdered in their mother's wombs by different forms of contraception. There has never been anything like this in the history of the world unless this was going on before the Noachic flood and we simply have no record of it. But unless that is the case, certainly from the time of Noah until today, there has never been anything like such a holocaust of innocent human life. We're talking about billions upon billions upon billions of innocent children being destroyed in their mother's wombs. Now, it's not difficult to sit down with an Orthodox or a Protestant who is of good will and wants to know the truth and is open to hearing from us. It's not difficult to show them that Genesis 38, the account of Onan, was understood throughout the entire Christian world in the same way for 1900 years as a condemnation of any kind of contraception or birth control that God considered it a capital offense and 
took Onan's life because he practiced this very sin. It's not difficult to prove that all the fathers who are revered in the Orthodox world held to this view without any exception. It's not difficult to prove to Protestants that every principal Protestant leader, Martin Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Melanchthon, on down to John Wesley, Charles Wesley, they all held that this was an abominable sin. Wesley says numerous, numerous Christians are destroying themselves, he says, because of this sin. And so this is the, the teaching throughout the entire Christian world for 1900 years until the Anglicans become the first Christian community in the history of Christianity to allow birth control to married couples. And of course we know that in the last almost 100 years, virtually every organized Protestant community has followed in their footsteps. So we can see clearly from this that the Catholic Church is the only church that has maintained the constant teaching that was handed down from the apostles in a matter of spiritual and physical life and death. And we're not talking about a little bit of physical and spiritual death. We're talking about the greatest holocaust of human life, innocent human life, probably in the history of the world by far. And we need to remember that it's this, it's the acceptance of this sin, it's the refusal to call it what it is and to preach against it that has led to all the other aberrations and abominations that we see running rampant in our society. Because as soon as you make excuses for contraception, you have absolutely no justification any longer for arguing against any other kind of abomination. Because as soon as you allow any separation of the unitive and the procreative dimension of the marital union, as soon as you say that, that this has something to do with anything other than one man and one woman joined together by God for life, you are absolutely without any ground to stand on. And this is why we have no credibility with our young people, because we don't make, I'm not saying never, but most of the time, we don't make any kind of coherent defense of the morality that we profess to uphold. And this is a very striking example of where the East desperately needs, the West needs to return to communion with the Pope of Rome and the teaching that has been preserved in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church from the beginning. And of course we know that Sister Lucia said in a letter um, which I believe is authentic. I know there are serious doubts about some of the later letters, but I believe this one uh, seems to be authentic. She wrote to uh, a cardinal that the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan would be about marriage and the family. Now this brings us uh, back to the consecration of Russia. Our Lady was clear that the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary by the Pope and the bishops will bring about the conversion of Russia. And it's very important to be clear, as Father Joaquin Alonso said in 1976, and if anybody was in a position to know, he was that person. He said there is no doubt that when Sister Lucia spoke of Our Lady's words regarding the conversion of Russia, she meant the conversion of Russia to full communion with the Catholic Church. She did not mean that all the Russians will become good Orthodox. She meant that the Russians will convert and they will return to communion with the Catholic Church. Now Padre Pio made a very interesting prophecy to some American pilgrims when they were asking him about the conversion of Russia. And he said, when it happens, it will happen very fast. 
He said Russia will give America a good example of what it means to convert. Now this is important because the conventional wisdom in the Vatican, not any kind of authoritative pronouncement from the Pope, certainly, but sort of the conventional wisdom is that Pope St. John Paul II consecrated Russia on March 25th, 1984, or possibly in the year 2000, with all the bishops, it was done. And because it was done in 1984, in the late 80s, the Soviet Union broke up, there was some liberalization, and religion began to make something of a resurgence in Russia and in the former Soviet republics. Well, that, as we will see in the next few minutes, is borderline blasphemy. Because as St. Padre Pio said, the conversion of Russia is going to be very quick, and it's going to be conversion to the full restoration of communion with the Catholic Church. And it's going to happen when the Pope and the bishops consecrate Russia by name, not the world with some implicit mention of Russia, but when Our Lady is obeyed, and she is obeyed exactly, and Russia is consecrated by name. Now, one very important point that needs to be reflected upon is, what is consecration? Here we have a picture of a woman being received into religious life. She's being consecrated into religious life. And when one of my daughters entered novitiate, it really reinforced something that I had begun to understand when I visited Russia and Ukraine for the first time. You see, because when I converted to the Catholic faith, when I was 18 years old, I read about Fatima and I fell in love with it and wanted to know everything that I could about it. But just about every book that I read gave me the impression that the consecration of Russia was supposed to fix Russia, because Russia had gotten all messed up with communism. And so when the Pope consecrated Russia, then everything would be straightened out. And I believed that, and most of the Catholics that I talked to who were serious about Fatima held to something like that point of view. But after I visited Russia and Ukraine, I realized this is absolutely wrong. This is completely wrong. And when my daughter entered novitiate and she was consecrated into religious life, that was like the capstone on my understanding of just how wrong that idea is. Because what I realized is consecration is not an action that takes something that's defective or disordered and fixes it. That is not what consecration is about. Consecration is about activating or realizing a potential within a person, place, or thing that already exists. So when a woman is consecrated into religious life, it's because she already has that calling, she already has that potential, but the act of consecration activates that so that she can fulfill the calling that she has. To think that consecration is an action that fixes something that's broken or disordered would be like saying that, well, we have this uh, damaged chalice over here, so let's consecrate it so that we can use it on the altar. No, we don't do that. We don't look at a woman and say, well, she's kind of neurotic and she's, she's got a lot of psychological problems and she's probably not cut out to be a good wife and mother, so let's consecrate her into religious life and that consecration will help her then to be able to you know, live a good life. No, these are absurdities bordering, bordering on blasphemies, but they're bringing out the point that Almighty God and the Blessed Virgin don't ask for a country to be consecrated because there's something wrong with that country. They ask for a country to be consecrated because there's something that that country, that that culture possesses, which is good. 
which needs to be activated and brought to its fulfillment. And if you visit Russia, if you visit Ukraine, you will see that there, and you'll understand why when that consecration of Russia is done, and remember, Ukraine was within the territorial boundaries of Russia when Our Lady asked for the, uh, Lucia to ask the Pope for the consecration. You'll see that the potential is there. The consecration is to activate that potential and to make it a reality. Now what happens when the Blessed Virgin Mary gives us a specific request and we obey it exactly without any deviation? Well, what happened in Mexico? We had pagan people who had been totally scandalized by the barbaric behavior of most of the Spaniards who came to the country who were ready to rise up en masse and slaughter every single one of them. And in that most unlikely moment, Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared, but she gave the Archbishop of Mexico City a request, and the request was to build a temple. So once he had seen the miracle of the Tilma, how long did he wait? How long did he wait to obey and do exactly what Our Lady of Guadalupe asked him to do? He didn't even wait 24 hours. And because he obeyed her exactly, and he did exactly what she asked him to do, there were 10 million people converted to the Catholic faith in the next 10 years. Is a consecration of the world the same thing as the consecration of Russia? We all know what happened with Saul when he decided that he knew better what kind of sacrifice to offer than what God had told him to do through his prophet. I think many of you are familiar with Father Gabriel Amorth. Father Gabriel Amorth was the chief exorcist of Rome for many years. And after doing battle for so many decades with the father of lies, I don't think he was about to tell a lie about something like this. And this is what he says as an eyewitness. The consecration has not yet been made. I was there on March 25th, 1984 in St. Peter's Square. I was in the front row, practically within touching distance of the Holy Father. Pope St. John Paul II wanted to consecrate Russia, but his entourage did not, fearing that the Orthodox would be antagonized. When His Holiness consecrated the world on his knees, he added a sentence not included in the distributed version that instead said to consecrate especially those nations of which you yourself has asked for their consecration. So indirectly, this included Russia. However, a specific consecration has not yet been made, as Cardinal Burke and Bishop Schneider and other church leaders have repeated. And we know that Pope St. John Paul II said that he entrusted to her, especially those nations of which you yourself have asked for their consecration, and that that was published in Observatory Romano. So let's think for a moment. What if a family had a, an older relative who was dying, who was very anti-Catholic, and uh, in order to bring down as many graces into their home as possible, they wanted their parish priest to consecrate their home to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Let's suppose that they talked to their parish priest about this, and the parish priest said, yeah, but you know, Grandpa, the last time I came over to your house, he started cursing and swearing and carrying on, and I really don't think it would be good for me to come and consecrate your home to the Sacred Heart under these conditions. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come to your neighborhood, and I'm going to consecrate your whole neighborhood to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and since your house is in the neighborhood, your house will share in that consecration. Now, who in his right mind would argue 
that because the parish priest consecrated the neighborhood, that that family's house was now consecrated to the sacred heart of Jesus. Well, it's the same in this case. How can we seriously argue that because the Pope consecrated the world with all the bishops, and because Russia is in the world, therefore our Blessed Mother was obeyed and Russia was consecrated. It's not serious. But the real proof that the consecration of Russia was not done is that Russia has not been converted. It's clear from beginning to end that the consecration of Russia will produce such immediate and dramatic effects that everyone in the whole world will know that this massive explosion of grace is the result of this particular act. Today in Russia, only six to seven percent of the population even goes to church on Sunday. They have one of the highest abortion rates in the world. They have horrendous problems with organized crime and alcoholism and a whole host of very serious societal problems. To say that this is the conversion of Russia is a blasphemy. But that's not all. You see, we don't hear about it very much any longer, but there's actually a war going on in eastern Ukraine. These are photographs of what has happened in eastern Ukraine fairly recently. Does it look like an era of peace has been granted to the world on the very borders of the Russian Federation? Now the reason this is relevant to our mission is that we know that when that consecration is done, according to Our Lady of Fatima's request, there will be a consecration, a, a conversion, a massive conversion of Russia, and that Russia will then become a light to every nation on earth. Together with Ukraine, they are sprung from the same root. And when that happens, they're going to come back into communion with the Catholic Church. And that restoration of unity between Eastern, traditional Eastern Christianity and traditional Christianity in the West, that's going to create an irresistible magnetism for all those Christians out there who belong to all these different splinter groups. They're going to be drawn in in spite of themselves. It's going to be the most wonderful thing that we've seen in the history of Christianity since the beginning. But we have to understand that we need to pray for this. One of the most terrible things about all the misunderstandings with regard to Fatima is that most good Catholics have stopped praying that the Holy Father will receive the grace to actually obey Our Lady of Fatima's request. It's totally diabolical. How are we going to obtain something if we don't even bother to ask for it? So we need to pray every day, and especially to teach our children and grandchildren to pray for the consecration of Russia as soon as possible. Because we've been warned, and Blessed Elena Aiello is only one of the authentic prophets who have warned us that if Russia is not consecrated as Our Lady requested, we're going to pay a very high price for it. Blessed Elena was shown that if, if people didn't convert, she said, another terrible war will come from the east to the west. Russia, with its secret armies, will overrun Europe. And it's not just because um, the, the Russian leadership are necessarily worse than the leaders of the European nations, for example. But you have to take into account that as long as we don't obey God, and as long as we don't do the things that he's told us to do so that we can have peace, we're allowing 
the human will to operate in all kinds of very destructive ways. And our leaders and the leaders of the EU countries have been doing all kinds of things to back Vladimir Putin into a corner where at some point he's just going to say, enough, it's better for us to just take the offensive. But we are responsible, our leaders are responsible for taking many actions which, if they were being done to us from the other side, we would never be willing to accept. And we know what Our Lady of Akita told us. Now, before I conclude, I want to share with you a way that I believe Pope Francis could be persuaded to actually obey Our Lady of Fatima's request. And I'm only sharing this with you because nothing would bring about the defeat of evolution, the principal error of Russia, faster than if the Pope were to consecrate Russia. So it's very much related to how we're going to accomplish the mission that God has given us as quickly as possible. Now everybody knows that when traditional Catholics of the Latin Rite approach Pope Francis and say, Holy Father, we've prayed 100,000 rosaries for you so that you will consecrate Russia. He just gets annoyed. But there is a way that I believe he would definitely find it almost impossible not to say yes to a request to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. <coughs> and that is if uh, Archbishop Shevchuk, the leader of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, and all the bishops of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church met together with Pope Francis. Keep in mind that Archbishop Shevchuk knew Pope Francis when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. They've known each other, they know each other very well, they've known each other for a long time. Now imagine that Archbishop Shevchuk and all the Ukrainian Greek Catholic bishops have a meeting with Pope Francis and they show him what's going on. Show him the devastation. Holy Father, this is a humanly hopeless situation. The more that diplomats do, the worse the situation gets. Would you please, Holy Father, would you please consecrate Russia by name? And while you're at it, you could consecrate Ukraine by name because Ukraine was within the territorial boundaries of Russia when Our Lady asked for the consecration to be done. But could you please consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart with all the bishops? What's he going to say to them? No, I don't need to do that because it was done in 1984. How's he going to say that when he sees this? Pope Francis has shown that when he's shown human suffering, he does have compassion for suffering people. I believe that if he were shown the suffering that is going on in eastern Ukraine right now, which is a very obvious proof that Russia has not been converted, he would find it very difficult to refuse to do something in five minutes if there was any possibility at all that it could actually bring peace to this part of the world. So I commend that to your consideration and to your prayers. But we need to remember, of course, that we know that the victory is assured because she didn't say, if you do these things, Russia will be converted. No, she said, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me. It's not any, there's no doubt about it. And she will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. And that's when the greatest evangelization in the history of the world is going to take place. That's what the saints have seen and talked about when the Muslims will be converted 
to the Catholic faith, and there will be, at least for a time, one flock and one shepherd visibly throughout the world. But how are we going to get there comes back to what I said at the very beginning of this retreat, that the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary is an interior triumph, so that what needs to happen in order to obtain the grace for the Holy Father to actually make the consecration of Russia by name with all the bishops is that enough of us have to live our consecration to Jesus through Mary in every moment of every day. And when enough of us are doing that, especially the little children, that's when there will be an unstoppable force unleashed and the, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart will take place and the grace will be there for the Pope to make the consecration of Russia by name. One of the wonderful young men here asked me if I could tell him what I thought would be a good way to live our consecration. And I didn't give him this answer at the time, but I wanted to share it with you because I really believe it's a very simple way of summing up a great deal. I'm sure you're aware that evangelical Protestants have spread this idea of WWJD, what would Jesus do? And you'll see people with these bracelets, WWJD, and I'm sure it does a lot of good. I mean, if I had a bracelet that said WWJD, and every time I had to make a decision, I asked, what would Jesus do? Things wouldn't be too bad. But that is a far cry from what we as Catholics are invited to do. Because when we consecrate ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Theotokos, we are called into an intimacy that goes far beyond what would Jesus do. What would Jesus do is Jesus is out there somewhere in heaven. And I have to imagine, well, if he were here with me, what would he do? And then I do that. That's not, that's not the life that he's calling us to. The life that he, that he gives us is to live one life with him and one life with the Blessed Mother. So sometimes I've done conferences with little children and my helpers have actually made bracelets that say J-W-S-W-D. Jesus, what should we do? Because the idea is that we're not separated from him. We're living one life with him. So in every moment, it's not what would Jesus do? It's Jesus, what shall we do? Because you're living in me. We have one life. What should we do? But we could even take it a step further and remember that when the miraculous medal was shown to St. Catherine Lavore in the Rue de Bac in Paris in 1830, you remember she was shown two versions of the front of the medal, and then she was shown this for the back. And people have sometimes asked, why do you have the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary with a space in between? <laughs> and I think the very good answer that some have given is because that's where our heart is supposed to be. So we could even say it's not just JWSWD, but JMWSWD, Jesus Mary, what shall we do? And think about it. What would happen if just everybody in this room, or let's imagine everybody in this room in our immediate family, what if from morning till night it was JMWSWD, Jesus Mary, what should we do? And we did it together with them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.